Well, hello there. Yes, I am back, and I'm coming at you with a review of the CEL Robox. Such a sexy printer. Oh my god. <laughs> How's it going guys? Angus here from Maker's Muse. So what I've got with me today is the CEL Robox, a UK designed printer that was launched on Kickstarter at the end of 2013. So the Robox made waves when it was released because it has a lot of unusual features such as having two heads with the same spools and the spools are actually intelligent and know what material they have on them and how much is left, which is really unusual and quite interesting for a printer of this price range. So, you know, I'm all about making 3D printing more accessible and easier to use here on Maker's Muse. So, does this printer deliver? Let's find out. Let's first talk tech specs. The Robox has a build volume of 210 by 150 by 100 millimeters, so it's a bit smaller than the Flash Forge at 230, 150, 150, but a little bit less height than even the Up Mini, which gives you about 120 mil. But to be honest, it's probably big enough for most projects I would normally print, and you can always print in parts if you need to. The machine has two nozzles of 0.3 and 0.8 millimeters, which use an innovative needle valve system to selectively shut off them during printing. So let's actually print with a fine nozzle for perimeters and a fill nozzle to quickly pump plastic into the infills. So you can speed up your prints, get a bit more strength, and also get a nice finish on the outside. And it's really quite unique and a very cool feature and um, something you're not going to see on other machines other than the Robox. Nozzles also tilt up out of the way, which is something that all dual extruder printers, in my opinion, need to be able to do. Finally, the extruder assembly itself is a Bowden design with a high torque stepper feeding along a Teflon tube to the head. I'm not usually a fan of Bowden uh, design extruders, but the tube in this case is so short that it works really nicely, and this is especially true because it has the needle valves blocking off the nozzles so you don't get the oozing that you see in machines like the Mancati. The machine also has these crazy cool smart spools which can tell the software what parameters to use and also how much material is left, something that's going to hugely improve the usability along 3D printing newbies. However, something I really respect Robox for is you're not locked down to their spools. You don't have to use their smart spools. You can use generic ABS, PLA, exotic filaments, whatever you want, and enter the parameters in yourself. So there's a lot of advanced features you can actually turn on. There's actually an expert tick box you can turn on in the software to unlock all these, all these um, features you other wouldn't, otherwise wouldn't normally be able to use. So I really respect Robux for letting that happen because, you know, as a tinkerer, you want to be able to do these things, but it lets the machine be used by people who don't know much about 3D printing as well. So schools and those sort of uh, institutions will find the Robox really simple and easy to use and pretty much foolproof in my opinion. The multi-purpose button on the side of the spool is a really nice aesthetic touch but it also lets you hot swap spools during a print so you can hold down to withdraw, change the roll and then a sensor will automatically guide the filament back into the head to continue. So none of this sort of, oh my god, I have to stop and pause the print by the computer, you can actually do it all via the printer. Although I do think that it needs some sort of display screen, it's a bit um, unusual having a printer with no screens or even you know other buttons on it uh, I would have preferred to see something on there but you can still do everything via the computer so it's not such a big deal and if it keeps price to point down I'm okay with that but the smarts don't stop there oh no you get automatic platform calibration and it actually works take that MakerBot fifth gen <laughs> okay so it actually does this quite quickly it will move around the platform uh, point by point and very quickly work out where the platform level is also do the touch off so you don't have to use a business card ever again and that's something that's going to come as a bit of a shock to people who have been involved with low-end 3d printers for a while but you don't actually have to do it the machine does it itself and it properly does it no z-axis offset you know uh, fudging it just it works and that's one of the things I've never seen in a printer out of the box before um, like with the ups, you set it yourself and then you're, you're done and you don't have to do it again very often, but this, you literally never have to do it. And that's awesome. There's also a whole lot of smart routines for sort of all kind of maintenance operations, for example purging. So if you're going between an ABS or an PLA or different colours, you do a purge routine which will change the colour and get rid of that sort of colour change gradient between the two. And also there's a lot of sort of maintenance things like if you get a blocked nozzle, there's blocked nozzle routines. or um, different ways the machine can try to clear it without having to disassemble the machine and stuff. Um, I must admit, I had a problem changing from ABS to PLA. The machine did um, uh, block itself and I heard it clicking and then the machine told the computer, I've got an error and it re reported an error saying your, your filament's not feeding correctly, do you want to do a purge? So, although I had to stop the print to do the purge, 
it meant I wasn't printing for hours with an air, you know, air printing and then coming back and finding that it was all, all disastrous. So the movement elements in the Robux are also pretty snazzy. It's got a very fine pitch uh, lead screw for the Z axis, which is quite uncommon. Usually you get quite a coarse sort of Acme thread or something like that. And the, the movement axes in general, the X, Y, Z and all that, are very sort of small but nicely designed and nicely made. So for, the, for a 3D printer, there's not much force on the uh, extruder head, especially when it's a Bowden, which means it can move very fast, it's got much less mass. And the way the Robux are being designed is it's very, very mi nicely minimalized and kept sort of small and, and simple, which is really nice. It's, it's a nice touch. And obviously an industrial designer has had something to do with this printer, or probably a lot of industrial designers, because it looks amazing. The Robux has to be the sexiest 3D printer I've ever seen, uh, period. Like, all the elements have been well thought out. The uh, enclosures, door for example, opens up with a really nice sort of guide system. And they could have just done sort of an open crappy door like the you know the 2X would have or the Flashforge Dreamer has. But they actually put the effort into having a nice curved transparent panel, which is pretty expensive to produce, and putting that into their machine because it flows nicely with the curved metal uh, chassis. Uh, did I mention the chassis is metal? It is actually all metal, um, on the outside at least. And it's a very nice feel, it's sort of a matte black finish. Um, and it's, it's, it's got a premium look to it. The Robox has been very well thought out through the interface and the printer design itself and it's something you don't often see with a printer that's under $2,000. Also just on the front door, there is actually a mechanical lock, it's actually a motorized lock that will lock the door in place and stop it being able to be opened while the printer axes are moving or the bed's too hot or the nozzles are too hot. So for school environments this is perfect. Kids aren't going to be able to touch anything and hurt themselves when this printer's in operation. Yeah, plus up mini, they can jam the hand into it, the machine won't know or care and it'll just keep trying to print with a hand in it and you know cause all sorts of lawsuits, whereas the Robox will not let you get into the chamber. However, having said that, the motorized lock is kind of easy to defeat. You can just sort of not put the, the um, top down all the way and it'll let the limit switch know it's down, but not actually let the lock catch. So if you're a tinkerer, it's not a big deal, you can defeat it, but um, in a school environment, it's awesome. It means you can lock down the printer and keep it safe. So now let's talk software. The software is called Automaker, and the premium experience continues on with the software. No expense has been spared, even on this side of things. It's beautifully laid out, but it does have a few weird quirks still. So the software is separated into various windows. First you have status, and you can expand this window to access the maintenance options. Then you have layout where you can have multiple beds ready to go in a really cool, neat, uh, tabbed format. And I haven't seen this before in a slicing program, which is really cool uh, and quite handy if you're sort of queuing lots of prints um, up, ready to go. Then you have the print settings, so you can change all your different settings, and you have make, where it will send the sliced print to the machine and give you real-time feedback and updates as the print's continuing. So the layout window is quite simple to use, you can select multiple parts at once and drop them in, but it's a little unusual in that, that it has no rotate object option other than around the z-axis. Rather, you have this lay flat option which will, um, because all STL files are triangles essentially, let you select one triangle and make that triangle flat on the print bed. It's a little awkward to get used to, but works fine. I, I do not like using this for prints that are very organic, because it makes it very hard to lay in a good orientation. Um, but it works fine for anything with a flat side, um, that's obvious. Auto Arrange is fantastic, but it does have a few weird quirks. I've noticed with some files, it's a little bit buggy and will auto arrange them to be outside the print area, or sometimes it just won't work at all. Uh, so, smaller objects it works fine, but bigger prints it can't seem to handle it. The bounding boxes are probably just a bit too big for it. The printer will display blue when the prints are good to go, yellow when they're intersecting on the bounding boxes, and red when they're too big for the overall print volume or they're out of the print volume. Scaling is also quite simple via the overall bounding box dimensions, or you can do it by percentage. And also it's quite neat that it shows on the left hand side the overall percentage of um, scale that you've done if you're doing, for example, multiple prints of different uh, scales. Duplicate works very well too, you just copy as many want and ones as you want and then hit uh, auto arrange to uh, put them on the bed. So if you're doing lots of small parts at once and they're all the same, you can use duplicate. So when you're happy, you can go to make, and this is where you can decide what printing parameters you want. So all the standard fare is here. You can make it um, different sort of settings. So they've made it more user friendly in the fact they've used little sliders. So you have sort of draft all the way out to fine. And if you want to really dig down to advanced features, you can set the layer heights down as low as 20 microns apparently. But most people won't ever touch these sort of separate settings. They'll just use the sliders. 
Uh, a big problem with the earlier software versions was the transfer speeds were really slow, but the latest update um, has really sped it up, and it's actually almost as quick as the up transfer speeds to the up plus two. And similarly as the ups, you can unplug the machine once it's transferred over, and uh, you know power down the PC or whatever you want, and the, the printer will just keep going. All right, so that's a huge amount of features, and realistically, there's actually a lot more I could talk about on the Roblox software and hardware options that you can choose, but really when it comes down to it, you can add all the bells and whistles you like. What we really care about as tinkerers is, does it print well? What's the print quality like? So this is the verdict. So the Roblox started off pretty good. I printed off the little robot it comes with in the software on the draft settings, and it looks quite good. I mean, it printed fast, and you know, draft settings with a 0.8 nozzle isn't too much to sort of sniff at. It looks all right for the setting that I used, but, um, Things started going horribly wrong when I started using the 0.3mm nozzle. So once I started using both nozzles at the same time, I started noticing with this print, for example, things were warping. So that's pretty inexcusable for a PLA print. And lines started appearing across the layers. Uh, you can also see the bridge here completely failed, so I couldn't print that. Um, and these lines started happening more and more on the 0.3 nozzle, no matter how many times I purged the head, to the point where things like this started happening. So with this print, things just went terribly wrong, the lines happened more and more, and then obviously some alignment issue occurred, and the printer just failed miserably. Uh, but what became really scary is, on the 0.3 nozzle, PLA plastic started leaking down from the top of the extruder assembly, and then dripping into the print. So I think some sort of valve must have failed, and what happened is I sort of took the extruder assembly off, and it was just full of PLA. And I don't know how this happened, it's a brand new machine, with a brand new extruder head and it would only been used for maybe five prints before this happened. Initially I was printing with ABS and the ABS parts actually looked quite sharp and nice but they were warping and lifting off the bed which is pretty disappointing and I think it's mostly down to that glossy fiberglass bed that they're using. I don't think it's very suitable for ABS parts. And yeah I don't want to let my experiences mar people's opinions on the Robox. I strongly believe that I may have had a faulty extruder head or some sort of faulty part. I've read, read it up on the internet, and I think that um, some people have had this sort of needle valve leakage issue, but uh, Robux is apparently are very good at fixing it and sending out replacement heads. So the machine is really impressive in all other ways, so, and I think that this uh, issue with the printer head may have just been down to a faulty part. So don't let it, it sort of mar your opinion, but it was pretty disappointing for me. So the final question to ask is, should you get a CEL Robux? Well, it comes down to who you are. So if you're just getting into 3D printing or you're an institutional school where you want a 3D printer as a tool that works all the time and you don't have to worry about anything else, about calibration, anything like that, it's definitely a machine to get because it does everything for you behind the scenes. You don't have to worry about what material you're printing with. You don't have to worry about it at the bed's level. It does it all for you. However, the print volume you're getting for the price is pretty small. Realistically, it's less height than Nut Mini and the Flashforge Dreamer for exactly the same price gives you an extra 150 in the height. So you're looking at 50, extra 50 mil of height and also 230 wide. So it's quite a bit larger. It also has the two nozzles of the Flashforge Dreamer so you can do two different colors. Whereas although the Robox has two nozzles, it's only one material at the moment. They, they, don't, they might bring out a, a dual uh, material printer in the future, but at the moment it's just one material at a time. So you need to consider these things. The Flashwood Streamer is fantastic if you're a tinkerer, you don't mind ripping the heads off, cleaning the gears, doing the calibrations yourself, then yeah, it's, it's a really good machine. But if you want a machine that just works and is safe for kids because you know they can't get into it while it's printing, the Robox is really cool. And you know, I am an industrial designer by heart. I like things that look good. And you know, as you can see, I like black things. This is my computer, it's my little mini ITX system, and this is the Robox. And they just they look like they're in the same ecosystem. They look like they should be together, they belong together, and the Robox is the closest machine I have found uh, since the Up Mini, to be honest, that I would be happy to have next to my desk. Whereas the Flashwood Dreamer, in my opinion, just looks looks pretty crap, to be honest. You know, it's this plasticky thing with you know flashy lights. It looks like some sort of appliance, but the Robox looks sexy. And it's a machine that I can see a lot of sort of industrial designers buying for that fact that clients can come in and say, oh, what's that? Oh, it's an amazing 3D printer. Okay, you're obviously you know, keeping up with the times. I'm going to give you my job. So thanks for watching, guys. Really hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to 3D Printing Studios for lending me the Robox and also Will Tronics, who are 
you know, lent us at 3D Printing Studios the Robux to test out. Uh, we've already been quite happy with it. Unfortunately, the, the ABS printing is a bit disappointing, but the PLA just looks phenomenal, and, you know, we're looking at getting better printers into schools, so the Robux might be the way to go. So, yeah, cheers for watching, guys. Really hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, please feel free to subscribe if you like. I am back from my holidays. I'm going to be doing so many more videos. So many videos for you guys. I've got, like, 32 different ideas for videos. I'm going to be pumping them out because, you know, it's what I do. <laughs> so cheers for watching guys. I'll see you around here again soon on Maker's Muse. Bye.